<laughs> that's 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 a uh, burka. Um, okay, uh, so let me go ahead and start. Um, let me um, welcome everybody uh, that, uh, to the online Spice uh, Spin Plus X seminar series. Uh, as usual, it's sponsored by Spin Phenomena and Disciplinary Center Spice uh, and the collaborative center between Kaisers Latin and Minds uh, Spin Plus X, uh, which is led by Martina Schliemann, Burger Hillebrands, and Matthias Chloe. Um, uh, this is a webinar format, as usual. Uh, you have questions, so please uh, write them on the Q&A so that after the talk, uh, we can give you the microphone, right? So you can actually ask questions directly to the speaker. Uh, next week, uh, to this tomorrow in a few hours, uh, we also like to promote the Around the Clock, Around the Globe Magnetics Conference that is going on. So you can actually find it in the schedule here uh, of the SPICE Spin Plus X seminars and connect to it. Uh, that will, and it will be starting uh, fairly soon. Uh, next week, uh, we hope to have uh, still a tentative uh, Saima Siduki um, to give us a seminar on electronic devices for artificial networks and remote line uh, following that. Uh, so once again, here, just to promote what is about to happen in a few hours, uh, this around the clock, uh, around the globe magnetic conference with people from an Asia Pacific time zone, European, Middle East and Africa time zone, Etc. Please uh, check it out. Uh, we encourage you to attend it. And then just to introduce uh, today's speaker, um, Axel Hoffman. Uh, this is one of the few people that I know that are as loud as I am uh, in the field of spintronics. Um, he's well known for uh, a lot of works, uh, particularly in the, um, in the works recent on, on the generating skirmions and production of skirmions and also uh, manipulation uh, through microwaves of uh, magnetotransport and magnonics. Uh, he has several awards. Uh, he was actually a distinguished lecturer at IWEEE Magnetic Society, like Matthias Clovis this year, um, and also has had uh, several awards like the Perry uh, uh, Outstanding Research Award um, uh, by the American Vacuum Society, Fellow of the Chinese uh, uh, Academy of Science, etc. So with this, I'm going to stop sharing. And uh, Axel, if you may, uh, please, uh, can you please send, try to share your screen now? Sure. Uh, uh, we'll see how well. It will take a little bit, so we'll, we'll try. The technology. Yeah, yeah. No, no, it's, it's perfect. Fun. So go ahead and start your talk when you want. Uh, and then I'll start recording in the cloud. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay, well, um, thank you, Jairo, for, for the introduction. And of course, thank you very much for, for organizing this series, which really has been great um, over the last couple of months. You know, it gives me an excuse to get up extra early on Wednesdays and um, you know, still have lots of fun with it. Um, so today, I'll, I'd like to tell you a little bit what we have done lately with uh, respect to hybrid magnet modes. Um, so when I sent Jairo the title of my talk, he said, hi, about magnet modes, that sounds too boring. You have to come up with something more sexy. So that's, that's how the title changed to this, you know, so we have now magnetic matchmaking. <laughs> so we'll, we'll see how it works. But, but I also think it, it, it's interesting to see, clearly this is a seminar series organized by, by theorists because it comes with a complete equation here. You have spice, um, uh, minus spin plus x down here. Um, let me see, there's something. Oh, oh. Um, and th that is really kind of strange. You know, what kind of equation is that? But I think it means, you know, it's equal to size. What do I know? Uh, maybe I can explain that at some point. What, what exactly? I will try to figure it out during the talk. <laughs> yeah. All right, um, there we go. So now here's a brief outline of, of my talk. Um, I'll start first with, with a brief introduction. Um, then I'll talk a little bit about what we do with on-chip uh, magnon-photon coupling. Um, then I'll talk about magnon-magnon coupling. And then in the last part, I'll talk about how we couple phonons to magnons. So. Um, you know, I'll show you the best first and then it gets progressively worse. And at the end, we have some conclusions. Um, so first here is my introduction, why we do what we want to do. 
So you all have heard of Moore's law, you know, this idea that um, over time, the number of transistors and the cost per device uh, uh, changes exponentially um, as, as the years goes on. And it's really quite remarkable how this held over several decades. And that has been pretty much the way how we have done computation um, for a long time. And the way how this computation then is done, it's simply based on uh, two very well-defined states um, that we present you know, logical one, the logical zero, and then you, you have a well-defined clocking sequence by which you clock your uh, things. And so everything is very deterministic and, and defined to have as little fault as possible. Um, and, and that's how we can do very precise calculations. Um, now, um, using this approach, it's really quite remarkable what happened. You know, some of us in the audience, like uh, Cairo and myself, are probably old enough that they have twiddled around with a device that looked like this, an early Apple II computer. Um, nowadays, you can have a device in your hand that's way more powerful than this computer. And, and you know, having seen that you know, myself, I think it's quite remarkable, um, this development. Um, together with this development, there's also other changes in computation um, these days. Um, namely, you have now most of your data decentrally stored in the internet. You know, that's what we know, the cloud. This then allows to have humongous amounts of, of data that you can analyze in various ways. And in order to analyze this, you, you start using um, artificial intelligence kind of schemes, uh, new morphic computation. We've heard in this series already some nice talks along those lines from uh, Mark Stiles recently and longer ago from uh, um, Julie Grolier, for example. Um, now, with this new morphic computation, you also start to change kind of the approach how you do computation. Suddenly, um, you're not so much interested in precise, accurate calculations. Um, you're, you're more trying to do some general uh, classification where things become more fuzzy. And it actually becomes useful to do computation and not just with extremely well-defined zeros and ones. You can have more analog signals that, that are not as well-defined and um, that, that helps to speed up the computation for specifically these tasks. And if you look further ahead, um, then you may want to do something even more radical, like, like quantum computation. Here, um, instead of having a well-defined zero or one, you use so-called qubits, where you have quantum states that are superposition of two individual quantum states. And so if, if you want, that's like the, the most analog, the most diffuse way how, how you can represent the data. And you know, if you believe the hype, then this will really work very well. Um, but, but maybe it's more like, like fusion, where it's always the computation of tomorrow, like fusion is always the power of tomorrow, right? Um, but so let's look a little bit more how this quantum computation works. So you have um, um, two individual qubits that represent some superposition of, of uh, two individual quantum states. And, and you exchange information uh, between them essentially through um, the exchange of, of uh, waves, if you want so, uh, where we exchange information in form of amplitude and phase of, of uh, your coherent coupling between these two qubits, uh, for example, via a, a microwave photon. Um, and um, so this then allows you to um, represent the data that you have in the qubit, uh, which is given essentially by some position of this block sphere um, where, where you have the amplitude, how much the zero, how much the one you have, and, and the phase um, of, of the position, uh, you know, laterally around this, this block sphere, um, how you can transmit this faithfully from one qubit to the next. And, this really is at the heart of um, how you do quantum computation. And, and um, in order to do this now in a realistic system, um, you often are faced with systems um, that use a variety of different quantum states. 
For example, if you want to communicate quantum states, uh, you often like photons because they're very robust even at room temperature and you can transmit them to, to uh, very um, long distances. Um, but, but they also relatively weakly couple um, to other systems. If you want to do computation, um, then for example, you like to use superconducting qubits, which you can have um, on, on a chip and you can use uh, microwave photons to strongly couple them to other systems and, and thereby do some very efficient coupling. But you may even think of, of other um, kind of implementation of, of quantum states that you want to have. So um, at the end of the day, if you want to have a fully working quantum computation system, you want to have various ways how you can couple a diverse variety of different quantum states to each other. And it turns out um, that microwave photons really have a very important point in all of this to play. Uh, one reason is, is that um, they have a long coherence time. Um, you can easily integrate them into an on-chip kind of device and you can couple them actually to a variety of phenomena. So, um, and you know, for us being in the magnetism world, it's nice, they really nicely couple to, to uh, magnetic excitations. So um, let's, let's look at this a little bit more. Um, in order then to um, faithfully transmit information between a magnetic excitation and the microwave photon, you want to be in what's known as the strong coupling regime. And this is here um, shown by an example from work from uh, Zixiao Zhang, uh, who placed an yttrium iron garnet sphere into a three-dimensional uh, copper microwave uh, cavity. And so what you see here is a plot of the, the resonance measured inside this cavity uh, the, the resonance frequency as a function of the magnetic field. And you see these uh, two modes that, that are um, split with each other. So um, what they represent is um, the, the mode, uh, a combination of two modes. One is a photon mode, which really is just a photon mode of the cavity, uh, which, which is independent of the magnetic field. And, and the other one, um, is the magnon mode of the yttrium iron garnet, which of course shifts with the applied magnetic field and, and it shifts uh, you know, upwards as you increase the magnetic field. And due to the interaction, then you get a splitting at the point where these two modes cross. And the, the uh, magnitude of the splitting gives you uh, um, a direct measurement of the, the coupling. And the coupling in this case is just um, how the magnetization of the Yig sphere couples to the uh, microwave resonance field of, of the resonator. Um, and when you have this coupling, what happens is, is that the excitation periodically goes back and forth between being a photon and a magnon. And so if you just uh, measure the, the, the intensity of the photon mode, uh, if you're in this coupled state, you see actually this oscillatory intensity, which is known as Rabi oscillations. And the periodicity um, is directly given by this uh, coupling strength. And so you're in the strong coupling regime if this coupling strength is larger than the T coherence time of either the, the magnons or the photons in, in your system. Um, and so you can define an important parameter, which is called the cooperativity, which is the coupling strength squared divided by these two T coherence times. So if you want to have a coherent interaction between these two uh, um, excitations, you want to have this cooperativity larger than one. And you know that's what we call strong coupling. So, um, and what this also means then is that the uh, um, um, coupling determines how many operations on your um, uh, quantum states you can have before they actually decohere. So it gives you the bandwidth, um, how many uh, operations you can possibly um, do.
Okay, so now let's go back and, and think about magnons. Um, most of you are familiar, but I'll briefly um, um, you know, go through to the basic motions. Um, if you put a magnetization into an effective field um, and the magnetization is, is not aligned with this effective field, the magnetization will precess around um, this, this magnetic field. And, and um, if the whole magnetization in your um, material does all the same thing, that's what we call the uh, uniform mode. Um, and we can describe this by the landau lifshitz gilbert equation, which has um, two components. One that describes the magnetization precession around the effective field. And then there's another component which describes uh, magnetic damping. And so this magnetic damping um, will over time align the magnetization with the direction of this uh, magnetic field. Um, and so um, the, the torques, how, the, how they work, the, the precession torque um, is uh, um, tangential to this precession direction and this damping torque will um, you know, decrease the, the um, size of the precession. Uh, the the set precession cone angle. And so the precession frequency is then given by the effective field. Um, and uh, um, we know that this corresponds to pretty much 28 gigahertz per Tesla. And the, the magnetization damping that we have in, in good magnetic systems where we want to look at the uh, uh, magnetization dynamics is of the order of 10 to the minus three or maybe lower if we have really good systems. And so we can define the quality factor for a magnet magnetic oscillator as one over the um, magnetic damping. Now, this is for uniform modes, but you can also have non-uniform modes where the magnetization in the system processes differently in different positions of your material. And that then describes spin waves, which is essentially uh, uh, similar to you know, other types of waves, let's say water waves. Um, they are given then by a dispersion. Um, if only the exchange interaction uh, plays a role, it's given by um, uh, the exchange constant times the, the, the wave vector squared. And, and what is nice is um, that if you look at excitations that are a couple of gigahertz, like the microwave photons that we're interested in, um, you get relatively short uh, uh, wavelength excitations. They are roughly 100 nanometers. Um, so this makes magnons very interesting because it allows for very compact devices if you want to do things at a microwave uh, kind of frequency. Um, so if you compare that, for example, to photons uh, at the same frequencies, we have wavelengths that are tens of centimeters, uh, much longer. Um, and phonons, still you have wavelengths that are about uh, one micrometer. Also notice that both for photons or phonons, the dispersion is linear in K, while for magnons it's quadratic, meaning that if you go to higher frequencies for magnons, you will quickly get even more of an advantage of scaling things down to uh, smaller length scales. Um, so that is one reason why it is nice to integrate magnons in your coherent uh, um, information devices because it allows to reduce the length scale quite significantly. Um, and at the same time, it's actually very flexible, right? Because you can uh, manipulate magnons very easily by changing magnetic fields. And we'll see that um, as we go forward. So uh, in terms of coherent information processing, um, which doesn't mean only quantum computation, but you can also um, think of coherent information processing. Uh, for example, I'm sure many of you listened at some point to Bogart Hillebrand's and, and he has some beautiful examples along those lines. Um, one of the advantages that you have if you want to use magnons in this way is that you can easily get strong coupling as we will show in this presentation. Um, so. And the reason for that is, is that the coupling strength 
um, goes as the square root of the numbers of spins that you have in there. And if you have a ferromagnet, you have a very high spin density and that will allow you to get a very large coupling. Um, at the same time, you can couple magnons to lots of different excitations. Uh, you can, uh, and we will show here in this talk how they can couple to microwaves. We will show how they will couple to other uh, magnetic excitations and to phonons, um, but you can also directly couple it uh, to light. So um, if you want to convert quantum states from microwaves to light, for example, to optical light, uh, magnons may be a very nice intermediary to do so. Um, then um, you do have two wave propagation that you can uh, uh, um, make use of. And so um, you can think of how you want to uh, uh, build magnonic logics by having spin waves propagating in different ways and interfere differently. Again, uh, uh, plenty of, of nice examples, you know, especially within the uh, uh, um, SPICE minus SPIN plus X consortium, you know. Um, so, but um, the other thing, and that's why I will focus on today is um, that magnetic systems are really very nicely amenable to integrate them onto on-chip devices. And, and I think that's, that's one of the uh, strongest uh, um, advantages that they bring to the table. Um, so if you want, there's a lot of phase space to explore using magnons for coherent information uh, processing. And if you want to have a better idea what, what our thoughts about this are, um, you can look at this, this perspective paper uh, which, which should be published in the Journal of Applied Physics pretty soon, I think, um, where we discuss this in, in much greater detail. But um, as I said, the, the advantage is that you can couple magnons to a wide variety of systems. You can use them in all kinds of uh, geometries, uh, complex uh, three-dimensional or, or planar geometries. And it allows you to um, explore a lot of interesting uh, nonlinear and non-reciprocal and all kinds of other physics um, um, by looking at these coherent interactions. So since I motivated it a little bit by, by quantum computation, um, I should mention that you can do this coherent coupling in the single magnon limits. And there's some really beautiful work um, here published by, by two different groups uh, where, where they coupled um, um, uh, a superconducting qubit in the microwave cavity um, with, with uh, um, another YIG sphere directly. And um, they can see the strong coupling between the magnon and this qubit mode in the single magnon limit, in the single quantum limit. Um, this is really, you know, very nice work. What I will talk about is at uh, much higher occupations where we use lots of quanta, so it's much more in the classical limits. But you can still get information about the strength of the coupling um, that may be relevant for these applications where you want to go to, to individual quanta. So the goal really is to think about microwave circuits um, that, that may be used in the quantum level that integrate also magnetic devices, but, but we will um, only discuss them now in, in the uh, classical uh, regime. So that brings me to the first um, example that I want to discuss, um, namely um, our demonstration of having magnon, strong magnon photon coupling in an on-chip device. Um, so if you look at magnon photon hybrid systems that were studied previously, um, they were mostly in uh, bulk materials where you use the bulk yttrium iron garnet sphere. Um, and the reason for that is, is they are very high quality, have very low damping. And um, then you integrate them into a bulk 3D cavity and you can certainly do a lot of beautiful uh, work with that, but it's 
not a way how you can make a scalable quantum circuit or uh, something more complex. Um, so we were interested in trying to see if we can do this in an all planar architecture. And so um, the way how we did this is we made a superconducting resonator uh, as a planar device uh, where we have a, a, a ground signal ground uh, a microwave strip line um, that we terminate capacitively at its end. So that sets our resonator length. And, and then in the middle, um, we then integrate um, a thin film magnetic system, which in our case is, is permaloy. So the photon system is consists out of a coplanar superconducting resonator that's made of niobium nitride. We use niobium nitride um, simply because in our group in Argon, we actually had quite some expertise in making nice microwave devices um, out of this uh, material. And, and one of, of the advantages is, is that the TC is rather high, it's 14 Kelvin. And um, so uh, what that means is the cutoff for microwave frequencies that you can use is actually much higher than if you were to use aluminum. Um, also, it means by going to the same temperatures, you just get much more high quality uh, microwave devices than, than you would get with aluminum on its own. Um, and then um, after having a better superconductor than what most people use, uh, we use the worse magnet than what most people use. So we use the permalite device instead of yttrium ion garnet. Um, one of the reasons simply is, is that the permaloy was very easy to integrate with this uh, superconducting resonator. And the other reason is, is that making really good yik that is still really good yik at low temperatures is a really tricky business. And um, so we did something easy here. The um, advantage is, is that we have a much larger magnetization than we would have with iTerm iron garnet. And so that will also help us in terms of getting into the strong coupling regime. Um, so here you see an actual picture of um, device that we uh, use and, and uh, we, we measure the microwave transition using a vector network analyzer. Um, again, here is the, the permaloy structure that's in the center of the device. So it's centered um, on top of the signal line. And you see here a cross-sectional schematic. So we separate the permaloy electrically by having an additional uh, magnesium oxide layer in between. Um, and the permaloy line is laterally a little smaller than the actual signal line of, of the superconductor. So first, let's look at the superconducting resonator on its own. Um, here you see the uh, transmitted power um, um, as a function of frequency. And um, so we see a narrow peak, um, the line with is about 67 mega, uh, 0.67 megahertz um, at a center frequency of roughly five gigahertz. Um, so that gives us a quality factor of roughly 8,000. Um, and this is measured at a temperature of 1.4 Kelvin with, with an uh, um, a f uh, incoming power of you know, uh, minus 55 dBm, so it's in, of the order of nanowatts. Um, now, we wanted to look then at the magnetic field dependence of this resonator. And what we see is that as we sweep the magnetic field, so the lower picture, we sweep the magnetic field from left to right. At the upper picture, we sweep it from right to left, from positive to negative. Um, we see that the uh, resonance frequency of this resonator does depend slightly on the field. And what happens is um, that as we sweep the field, we do introduce um, uh, vortices in the superconductor and the vortices um, give rise to, to additional kinetic inductance, uh, which thereby decreases the, the resonance of the um, uh, resonator that we have. And, and we see this behavior as hysteretic, um, but so this is our baseline for when we look at a system that has a magnetic system, um, uh, magnetic component integrated into it as well. 
So here we now look at the um, uh, resonance of the permaloid stripe on top of this structure. We, we measure um, this at the same temperature with much higher power. And so here you see the resonance frequency as a function of magnetic field. And as expected, we see um, um, uh, magnetic field dependence that can be explained by a simple Kittel equation. Um, nothing surprising here. Um, we can also measure the line width of, of this structure. Here, the line width is around you know, 0.15 gigahertz, um, right when we are at the same five gigahertz. Um, so the damping is 0.01, uh, you know, maybe a little bigger than 0.01. Uh, so it's not the greatest, um, but, but this is all known that when you take permaloy and you cool it down, the damping actually goes up. Um, but it's sufficiently good for, for what we are trying to do here. Um, and, and so we, we do extract this damping here from the uh, dependence of the line with as a function of frequency. And, and, and while there is you know, some additional structure in there, it's, it's mostly linear. Um, so now we look at the magnon photon hybrid system. So as a uh, reminder, um, this is the um, field dependence of the resonance frequency of the niobium uh, nitride resonator without the permaloy. Um, now, when we have the permaloy in there, we see um, that there is um, a strong mode splitting at the point where the magnon excitation crosses the excitations of, of the uh, uh, photon uh, resonances in our system. So we see a mode coming down here and we see an additional mode um, that, that's here on the top. So we can get the photon damping rate um, by being far away from this crossover point. Um, we see that now the damping rate is two megahertz instead of the half megahertz that we had earlier. Um, so just simply having uh, um, the permaloy device integrated into the resonator deteriorates the, the properties of the resonator to some extent. Um, but then we can also look now at the coupling energy between these two by, by looking at the splitting. And when we do this um, carefully, um, we can analyze uh, the, the, the transmitted uh, um, power um, using this equation where we have the uh, uh, de decoherence rate of the photons, the decoherence rate of the magnons. Um, we have the, the frequencies of the magnons and the photons, and then the remaining fitting parameter is essentially the coupling strength here. And when we fit this, we get a coupling of 0.1 gigahertz. And if we calculate now the cooperativity, we get a cooperativity of about 70 which is pretty uh, remarkably good, um, I would say. Um, so let's compare this a little bit further. If we compare this to the measurements um, that were previously done on bulk yttrium iron garnet spheres. Um, so as I said, for our result, we get a cooperativity of about uh, 68 which is very comparable to what you get with these Z spheres. But um, we have um, a magnetic system that is much, much smaller in, in volume um, than the yttrium iron garnet system. Um, so we can now also calculate what is the coupling per individual spin in our system. Um, because we know that the overall coupling, uh, uh, the, the coupling per spin should be given uh, by this coupling divided by the number of spins in, in our system. And if we do this for our permaloy stroid, we get a coupling per spin of about 26.7 Hertz. And if we compare this to this Yig sphere, there the coupling per spin is much, much smaller. Um, so it's only 0.04 Hertz um, per um, spin. And, and the reason is, is that here we have our, our magnetic system very nicely situated in where the maximum of the photon field is. And the, the volume is, is, is really very well matched to, to all of this. Um, 
So that allows us to, to get much stronger coupling, you know, effectively per spin in, in this device structure. And you can do even better. Um, so here's an example from Lu Xiaolio's group at MIT who did some beautiful work, very much similar to, to what we have done, um, where using a different design of the superconducting resonator, they can even enhance uh, the coupling per spin by an order of magnitude here. And, and really, this is just the beginning. I'm sure there is still more room for improvement and uh, it will be interesting to see how this uh, changes with time. Now, um, I was saying earlier that one of the beauties of using uh, Magnon systems in these uh, um, uh, um, uh, coherent information processing things is that we can modulate the coupling at will. And one way how we can do this is by simply changing the orientation of the um, magnetic field with respect to our stripe. The reason is um, the, the RF resonance field is always perpendicular to the stripe, the way how the stripe is integrated in the uh, um, resonator. And so if we align the magnetization perpendicular to the stripe, then there is no coupling between the magnetization and the R field anymore. So as we rotate the field around, we expect the coupling to decrease. And indeed, that's what we see. You see as the angle becomes smaller, this gap between the two modes vanishes until it goes completely away um, at 90 degrees. Now we see still a little gap here in the center. And the reason is of course that at the center, what happens is there is no field anymore to saturate the permalloy stripe perpendicular and the magnetization will rotate back to be along the stripe. And you do get a little bit of coupling here um, um, that, that leads to this gap in the excitation. But if we um, now plot the, the uh, coupling strength as a function of this uh, angle of the orientation of the magnetic field, we'll see that it follows very much a cosine kind of behavior as you would expect from the geometry of, of the coupling. Um, so we can also look how the coupling uh, depends on the size of our magnetic system. Um, as I said earlier, we expect that the coupling should go as the square root of n um, uh, with the coupling of the, of the system. And um, so by making our permalloy strip uh, bigger, we can increase the volume. By making it laterally smaller, we can decrease the volume. And when we do this, we see that um, overall the coupling scales very much with the uh, number of spins as we would expect. It goes as a square root of the volume um, of the system that we have there. So um, that, that all checks out nicely. So um, I want to show one last thing um, that, that's kind of interesting. Um, now, all the measurements that I've shown you so far were at really low power. So you were talking nanowatts. Um, to avoid any significant heating of the resonator, which degrades the power. Uh, but if you just look at the superconducting um, resonator, it actually has a very pronounced nonlinear behavior as we increase the power. So here you see the transmitted power as a function of frequency uh, for different uh, power in, in the resonator. And um, while we apply a magnetic field, and, and you see that from going from a nice uh, Lorentzian kind of peak here, we, we get this uh, fold over uh, behavior, which, which indicates strong nonlinearities. And this strong nonlinear behavior is directly related to um, introducing vortices in the superconductor. And the, these vortices um, um, are now generated by the strong IF power, not just by the field that we have. And uh, as before, they, they give rise to additional inductance, which decreases the frequency. And, and that's the type of behavior that you see here then. Um, 
Interestingly enough, if we operate our magnon photon system in this high power regime, we do see that the um, mode splitting increases slightly. Um, it increases by about 15%. Um, and so what we think is happening is um, that the magnetization in the um, permalloy couples then directly to the magnetic vortices in the superconductor. And that provides an even stronger coupling than just uh, through the R field alone. Um, so there may be some interesting uh, um, possibilities there as well. So that um, finishes what I wanted to say about our on-ship magnon photon coupling. And now I want to get to our uh, second type of device where we look at magnon magnon interactions in, in uh, bilayer structures. Now, one of the issues if you want to build a microwave quantum circuit is that it's inherently two dimensional. There's no nice way how you can make a crossover of a microwave signal or, or something, something that you have in a more complex integrated chip where you have a much more three dimensional architecture of what you want to do. Um, so the question is now, how can we do something that's more three dimensional and, and more um, uh, complex possibly? You know? um, I'm not suggesting that we use Van der Waals materials, but they do look nice. So <laughs> that's, that's why I have this picture here. Um, but magnetic systems actually may offer a nice opportunity here because um, the magnons in the magnetic system are naturally, of course, uh, uh, confined to the magnetic material where they are. And so that may allow you to come up with a structure that becomes much more three-dimensional. And so you can stack two magnetic layers on top of each other, or you can make a much more complicated structure where then the, the microwave signal also can translate in the thickness of the film and, and do some other um, kind of um, functionality. Now, with this in mind, we then wanted to see, okay, how can we uh, transmit coherent information from one layer to the next? And so uh, there were a whole bunch of, of nice examples. Um, uh, for example, uh, from Matthias Weiler in, in, in Munich and others um, um, where you combine yttrium iron garnet with another ferromagnet and if you, if they share a common interface, they have of course direct interfacial exchange coupling here. And here you see uh, measurements where they have a cobalt on top of yttrium iron garnet and, and you see all kinds of mode crossings of lots of quantized spin waves in the yttrium iron garnet uh, that, that cross over this uh, cobalt ferromagnetic resonance mode. Um, so, but one of the issues are, um, and, and you see this already very nicely in, in this um, diagram is, unless you have some additional anisotopies and what, if you have two different magnetic systems, um, then they really only cross over close to K equals zero. Um, uh, because the, the Kittel equation is given by the saturation magnetization and these effective fields. So if you don't have um, any other anisotopies here, it goes as the square root of the magnetization. And if the magnetization is much higher for the cobalt, it always lies underneath where the yttrium iron garnet mode is. Um, one way how you can get around this, and this is what you see here, is um, by using um, modes that have a finite wavelength. And um, in particular, what you can do is you can use a, um, a finite wavelength mode um, that is given by the thickness. So if you think about it, if you have a finite wavelength, then the, the, you get an additional exchange field contribution. This exchange field contribution will um, scale as the square of the wave vector. And um, if you have a quantized mode across the thickness of your film, 
then the wave vector is simply given by the thickness of your mold. Um, so with this in mind, uh, what we want to do is in these kind of experiments, the yttrium iron garnet film was very thick, you know, uh, 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 for a tenth of a micrometer of, of that, or a thousand nanometers. So that's why you see lots of these modes crossing over everywhere. Um, so what we would like to do is uh, reduce the thickness which will increase the wave vector and therefore move this mold even further down so it's easier to separate. Um, so uh, what we then wanted to do is, is simply use uh, thinner yttrium iron garnet films. And so by doing this, we can then uh, uh, very clearly resolve an individual mold splitting by an individual uh, uh, standing wave and, and the homogeneous uh, ferromagnetic mode in, in the ferromagnetic layer. And so our two-state uh, system here consists now of a magnon in one layer and a magnon in uh, the second layer. So having said that, we uh, grew a 100 nanometer thick YIG film with, with uh, sputtering and uh, we grew uh, permaloy films with different thicknesses on top of it. So the yttrium iron garnet film was sputtered on gadolinium gallium uh, garnet actually at room temperature. And then we post anneal it to crystallize the, the yttrium iron garnet and, and get uh, a nice uh, low damping film. And um, then after this process, uh, we deposit the iron, uh, the uh, permaloy by first iron milling the yttrium iron garnet surface to get a fresh surface so that we get uh, a nice, uh, strong uh, um, interfacial coupling uh, after sputtering the permaloy on top of the egg. And so, as I said, the goal is to see exactly something like this, where we have the fundamental mode of the egg, uh, we have the uh, fundamental mode of the permaloy, um, and then the uh, spin wave mode that becomes split right around this area here. Okay, so here is um, now the data on our device. Um, so indeed, you see here the uh, fundamental mode, the, the homogeneous mode of the yttrium iron garnet. The, the first uh, spin wave, uh, uh, the first thickness quantized spin wave mode in the yttrium iron garnet, and the uh, second um, uh, quantized spin wave mode in the yttrium iron garnet. And indeed, we see nicely here the splitting between the modes uh, where they cross over. And so we can analyze this now in greater detail. Um, so to make this easier, um, what we will do is we will shift all the resonance frequencies with respect to the resonance frequency of the um, uh, homogeneous yttrium iron garnet mode. And that's what you see here. So the yttrium iron garnet mode um, is defined as zero here. And now we see easily how as a function of frequency, the permaloy mode disperses right through the um, um, thickness quantized the spin wave mode of the yttrium iron garnet. And, and you see nicely how in the crossover regime, we have these separate modes um, here. Um, we can as before, calculate the, the coupling constant and compare it to the dephasing rate of the permaloy and the yttrium iron garnet on its own. So the dephasing rates we can determine being far away from the coupling and uh, the uh, um, coupling we get uh, at, at the coupling mode uh, on itself. And when we do this, we get a cooperativity of six. You know, it's an order of magnitude less than what I showed you earlier but it's, it's still uh, you know, quite significant. Uh, so in the field domain, this corresponds then to this mode splitting of about um, eight and a half millitesla. Now, but what is nice by having these modes very nicely separated, we can actually in detail now also analyze the line shape and uh, the line width of these modes as we go into this strong coupling regime. And this becomes kind of interesting. Um, 
so being far away from the coupling, we can um, get the intrinsic uh, dependence of the uh, line width as a function of frequency, both for the yttrium iron garnet and for the permaloy. And in the coupling region, we see a couple of interesting features. Um, one is that the um, uh, crossover of the line width is actually slightly different from where the crossover of the resonance frequencies is. But more importantly, um, in the strong coupling regime, we see um, that the line width of the hybrid mode actually becomes even lower than that what we would expect from the yttrium iron garnet mode alone. And uh, the, the other hybrid mode the line width becomes actually larger um, than um, the coupling, um, than what you would expect from the permaloy alone. So this tells you um, that there is not just your normal exchange interaction, but there's something more complex going on that you also have some form of dissipative coupling um, that changes the line width of, of these modes. And so, we can um, express this by using um, a complex coupling constant, which has a real and an imaginary part. Um, so this is a dissipative coupling. And um, so by analyzing it further, what we can see is um, that the ordinary coupling is like a field-like coupling that comes from the interfacial exchange coupling. But this dissipative damping-like coupling comes from spin pumping between the magnetization modes, between these two magnetization modes. And we see that here for this hybrid mode, um, this dissipative coupling increases the damping and here it actually suppresses the damping. So what happens is um, by thinking about this, we can easily then identify uh, the modes as such that here, where the damping is suppressed, we have actually an acoustic mode where um, the magnetizations are in phase. And uh, so then the mutual spin pumping between these two modes will actually reduce the uh, um, um, damping overall. While this mode is the optic mode where the two magnetizations process out of phase. Um, and that leads to an enhancement of the damping. So um, we can actually fit this uh, to a theoretical model, which is shown here by these uh, uh, solid lines. Um, and if we don't take the spin pumping into account, we get these dashed lines um, where, as I said before, the, um, damp uh, the, the line width is actually bounded by the line width of the individual modes. And you don't get these uh, uh, line widths that are outside of what you expect from the modes on their own. Um, so how do we model this? Well, essentially we just take the Landau-Lifschitz-Gilbert equation that we've seen before, this thing. Um, we add an interfacial exchange coupling term and we add a damping like spin pumping term where you have mutual spin pumping from the uh, yik to the permaloy and the permaloy to the yik. And so we have a set of coupled equations for um, these two magnetizations. Um, and when you solve this, what you will see is um, that indeed the uh, field-like torque is given by the um, interfacial exchange interaction and the damping-like torque can be described in terms of the uh, spin mixing conductance um, that um, um, gives you how easily the uh, uh, spin currents are um, transferred across the yttrium iron garnet uh, permalloy interface, and we get a value of uh, 42 um, nanometer um, um, in inverse nanometer squared. Now, what's interesting is this model also tells us that we would expect the uh, um, both the real and the imaginary part of this coupling constants 
to be pro inversely proportional to the square root of the thickness of the individual layers. So this is something we can easily check. We can use different uh, thicknesses of permalloy. And indeed, when we look at the real part of the coupling constant as a function of the permalloy thickness, we see that it uh, decays um, um, as the inverse of the square root and not just simply as one over the thickness as one might naively expect. Um, so um, vice versa, we can express um, the uh, imaginary part of this coupling constant in terms of this uh, uh, parameter beta, which uh, um, takes account of the frequency dependence of the line width um, uh, changes that we have. Uh, so it's a little bit easier to analyze than this uh, uh, parameter, which has an explicit uh, uh, um, frequency dependence. And when we plot now beta squared versus the thickness of the beta, again, we get the roughly uh, um, the behavior that we expect. The no data here is much noisier than, than there, but overall it, it's a, in good agreement with what we expect from this theoretical modeling. Um, so I should briefly also say that um, the fact that the acoustic mode is at a smaller resonance frequency versus the optic mode uh, shows that we have antiferromagnetic coupling between the YIC and the permalloy, which is consistent with uh, uh, what has been observed before. Um, uh, um, and so the, the, the coupling constant is, is negative here. Um, and, and you can see this because you see that the uh, mode of the permalloy on its own um, without any yttrium iron garnet lies slightly below the permalloy mode uh, that's on top of the yik. And, and that's just because of the um, negative exchange coupling that you get when the permalloy is on top of the yik. Um, now, I'm seeing I'm running out of time. I do quickly want to talk about manipulating phonon transport with magnons and uh, I'll keep it to three minutes, I promise. Um, so essentially there has been a lot of very interesting uh, uh, work again by uh, um, uh, Matthias Weiler and others uh, where they integrated nickel into a surface acoustic wave kind of device based on lithium niobate and uh, by exciting uh, magnetostatic waves, what happens is that you uh, strain the nickel film on top. And so the magnetoelastic coupling will then act as an additional RF uh, effective magnetic field that can excite magnetization dynamics. And so you can uh, um, um, look at elastically driven uh, um, magnetization dynamics. And, and here you see an example where the FMR is given by these uh, broad uh, uh, transition peaks here. And so one of the things that when we looked at it, we thought, why is the line width so large? I mean, part of it is nickel, which doesn't have the best damping to begin with, um, but but maybe there, there are other reasons that are interesting. And so we started making our own devices. So we put the nickel on lithium niobate. Um, so here you see an image we have these two uh, interdigitated transducers, which are, uh, are used for exciting and uh, measuring these uh, surface acoustic waves. In our device, we can look up to like the 11th, 13th harmonics. Um, so we looked at two devices, one where the nickel was just as grown, another one where we annealed it afterwards um, to get better uh, interfacial contact. And what you see here is, so as, as, as you go to different harmonics, essentially you measure at different frequencies, right? So if you look at different uh, transmissions of the surface acoustic waves, um, we see in the annealed sample um, that we have clear dips in the transmission so that these, uh, mic uh, the surface acoustic waves are absorbed by the magnons. Uh, while in the s grown device, there's much less indication that anything is happening there. Um, so this is just another way of plotting this. In the anneal device, we have these well-defined minima, while here, if anything, we have even slight maxima. 
at around similar fields. It turns out you can actually model this behavior of these two samples very well um, by having everything the same. And the only thing that you change is the strength of the interfacial coupling, um, which in the anneal device is about 10 times larger than uh, in the Asborn device. Um, but I'm not gonna go into great detail. It's a complicated story. Um, it involves both the attenuation of phonons, but then as soon as you excite magnons, you may also generate phonons again. Um, so you get, you get minima, you can get maxima, it's both possible. Um, it, it's quite fascinating and, and complex. Um, so we'll see, there'll more work to be done. Um, but what I want to say is when we extract then from this formula, the line width of the ferromagnetic resonance, it is actually consistent with what we measure of the nickel on its own if we measure it in an inductive measurement. Um, so the, the increased apparent line width in these uh, phonon transmission is not indicate that the uh, magnetic damping of the um, uh, nickel film is deteriorated, um, but it is really indicative of the phonon magnon coupling that we have here. Um, now I should also say in these devices, sadly, we are far away from being in the strong coupling regime. Okay, so now um, it's an hour after I started, so I should finish. Um, I should briefly introduce the group that did this work. Really, uh, most of this work was done with my group when I was still at Argon, where I was until last year. And the main driver of all of this is uh, EEG. He's a fantastic, superb young scientist. Um, I'm really very lucky to have been uh, working with him. He has been the main driver, especially of the first two um, subjects. Uh, uh, so this was done by E. Lee. Um, the uh, magnon phonon work was done by Chen Bo Zhao, who was a visiting student um, who is now back in China. And there were a whole bunch of other players that, that helped us in this work. Um, I would also like to point out, for example, that the theory work for the magnon-magnon coupling was done together with Vivek Amin and Mark Stiles um, at NIST. Um, and so um, all of this was supported by DOE. Now in conclusion, what I've shown you is like three different type of devices uh, where you couple uh, magnons to photons, magnons to other magnons and magnons to phonons. And um, what is nice about all of these type of devices, all of them can be integrated into planar devices. Uh, so here we have a planar a phonon, a photon resonator uh, with uh, magnetic systems. All the, you know, we are very uh, uh, well familiar how to do various magnetic heterostructures. And even here in these phonon devices, it, it's all in an on-chip kind of geometry. So all these three approaches lend themselves very nicely to more complicated on-chip devices in the future. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and I'll be more than happy to answer whatever questions you may have. Thank you very much. Okay, so that's the clapping and uh, I hope uh, everybody's enjoying it. Uh, if it's big, they are clapping already, or, you know, handing, you know, raising your hand. Uh, now, um, let's continue now with the questions. Uh, there's a few questions from the audience. Let me hang on for a second. Uh, in there. Oh, sorry. They really got excited for a second. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, uh, let me find uh, the attendee that wants to ask a question. So, um, uh, Pinaki, uh, go ahead and ask your question. And maybe man, unmute yourself. And Thank you, Hiro, and uh, thank you, Axel, for a nice talk. It's it, it didn't feel like 112 slides. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cool. yeah, that's 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 what happens with Axel. You know, the time flies by. <laughs> <laughs> it's indeed, indeed. Uh, I have a, a quick question. I sure. uh, there has been other uh, I've seen other proposals where coupling to microwave for, uh, photons results in either. Uh, amplification of magnon density at selected momenta, or alternatively, I've seen uh, 
uh, enhancement of effective DM interaction in the material. What determines what process I'm going to see? Is it um, lattice uh, discretization? Because yours are um, in the continuum, whereas the works that I uh, refer to all are for uh, lattice systems. Yeah. Um, well, very good question. I mean, I'm not entirely sure um, what what work you're referring to um, there, but but by the way, these are all theoretical works. <laughs> theoretical proposals. <laughs> he doesn't read those. <laughs> so <laughs> no reason I don't know about it, but <laughs> no no no. Uh, so. Um, I, I would say, I mean, look, the coupling here between the microwave photons and, and, and the magnetic systems is really very straightforward. It's really just the, the RF microwave field that directly couples to the magnetization. So um, if, if you think in terms of lattice of the atomic lattice, then I certainly don't think about that. Um, if you think of a, a magnetic structure that is you know, periodically um, kind of structured in a way, that that could matter in, in some yeah way. it's mostly creating an annihilating pairs of magnons uh, uh, by absorbing or releasing a photon so uh, quantization of the magnons themselves um okay um but but i i, I would let the others ask questions I, I, I'm, I'm not sure that i have much intelligence to say uh, in that respect to be honest <laughs> No, but, but and I, mean, I completely no, be, look believe you. Papers to get a better idea. Okay. So let's, uh, let's ask, uh, I think, uh, Matthias. Matthias, uh, Chloe has a question. Uh, hi, Axel. So thanks. It was a really nice talk. I have a question about the last part, about the interaction between the magnons and the phonons. Now, um, do you know, in your lithium niobate, it's about crystal, I guess, or is it in film? Sure, yeah. It's a single crystal. Yeah. Um, so... Um, so so, so how, how far do actually photons propagate if you launch them somewhere? What is the decay length as a function of the frequency? Oh, look, I mean, the device here is, is like half a millimeter, right? Mm -hmm. So you can okay. easily have um, uh, millimeters, centimeters, no problem. Okay. And do you know how um, the uh, quality of the substrate influences then the enhanced line width of the magnons? I mean, because you need energy dissipation in the phonon bath to enhance the magnon line width by this magneto elastic coupling. So, uh, because I, I'm, I'm asking because there's this work by E.G. Saito where he looked at this magnon phonon uh, polarons, and then sometimes the acoustic quality of the material was better than the magnetic quality, and sometimes the magnetic quality was better than the acoustic. In your case, you always increase the line width of the uh, ferromagnet by coupling to the uh, phonons. Um, so, the um, that that's a very good. I mean, so certainly, what, so what we looked at is just how different um, annealing conditions change the coupling between the two. We didn't see that much difference from substrate to substrate, so we, we I don't think we have much um, um, systematic work where we can say how things change as as the quality of of the surface acoustic wave uh, propagation changes. Um, but um, all I can say is, is that um, it does become a very complicated kind of story that depending, um, I mean, this is essentially what, what you see here, right? Um, you can actually get even an enhanced transmission of the phonons because of the coupling to the magnons if the coupling is, is significantly weak. Mm. You know? Okay. Yeah, no, thank you. I think it's really exciting. Thanks. Um, okay. Uh, I think we have uh, Antonio. Oh, sorry, she left in there. Gilles, let me give you a floor here. Uh, Gilles Shen, uh, did you have a question? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Can, can you hear me? Yeah, okay. I can hear you. Okay. Uh, thank you for a nice talk. And I have a very quick question. Uh, so, why don't you use the X stripe for, uh, instead of Pomeroy stripe for study magnum photon coupling uh, by uh, superconducting resonator? Okay. Um, so, 
first of all, simply um, growing, if, if you look at this, right, um, growing the, the uh, permaloy on top of, of the niobium niobate is very simple. You know, you can easily do that. If you want to yeah. grow yik on top of the niobium nitrite and do it well, that's really hard to do. Um, then the other possibility is you grow yttrium iron garnet on GGG and then put all your superconductor on top. But it turns out that's not good either because uh, uh, GGG is a frustrated magnet um, that has all kind of magnetic stuff going on um, at, at low temperatures. And it turns out that if you look at YIC on GGG at low temperatures, it's not such a great, uh, uh, it doesn't have low damping either anymore because of the coupling to the GGG substrate. So uh, YIC at low temperatures is a real headache um, to do it right. Yeah. And, and uh, so permaloy is just much easier. Um, but it's probably not the, the, the uh, you can probably do better than permaloy also. It was just a simple starting point for us. Uh, so we have some ideas of other materials that we might want to use. Or you can do something fancy like uh, what, what uh, Georg Schmidt does in Halle. You take some freestanding uh, yik and then move that on top of it. But um, yeah, we are not that yeah, fancy yet, hard. I'm afraid. <laughs> okay. okay, thank you, thank you. I think it's very good that Axel is, is, is matching everybody that is online. He's <laughs> <laughs> is, is hearing you. I try my best. <laughs> 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 and, and Mark is also hearing you. Yeah, he was a walk up. Uh, you know, he was always <laughs> checking to see if I'm checking my email during the talks. Um, yeah, I don't see any more questions at the moment. Um, uh, so uh, with that, I think anybody else uh, would like to have a hand, put their hands up if you would like or not. Um, okay, uh, that seems to be it. Uh, oh, sorry, Philip here has a question. Let me uh, keep, go ahead, Philip. Go ahead and ask your question. Hi. So thanks for for your nice presentation. Um, where at the very end you were talking about um, that the coupling between the magnons and phonons in this nickel uh, phonon system would be quite low. Did I understand that right? Um, no, I don't think that's exactly what I wanted to say. Um, what happens is um, the, the coupling can be actually reasonably strong when we have um, the, um, the um, uh, uh, device annealed. Um, so for the annealed device, we get stronger coupling than this. Now, this, this ETA doesn't really compare easily to something else that I've shown because you have to stick it in this, this complicated formula that probably somebody like Cairo might enjoy, but I don't. And um, um, very, very so what, <laughs> what, what, what we, uh, uh, um, and, and we don't get into the strong coupling regime where like previously, we can pull out the, the coupling strengths from mode splitting and, and things of that nature. Um, that's mostly because the, the, the uh, uh, dissipation rate of the magnetic system here is so high um, um, that, that we can't achieve that. Um, so, so I can't easily compare it to the first two examples, um, but, but the, the, the coupling itself, I think can be strong. So to increase it, you simply would choose a material with a lower damping or a higher magnetoacoustic interaction? Well, uh, ideally you have both, right? Uh, higher magnetoelastic uh, uh, coupling and lower damping. And so that seems like, like a miracle material um, we have, we have <laughs> because these two you know, naively seem kind of mutually exclusive. But, but I don't think, um, I, I think there are possibilities there, but, but it, this is gonna be a little bit more tricky, I think. Okay. Thanks. So that, uh, 